just briefly, one of the things that I do as a creative writing tutor is I run a six-week online self-ed your course, uh, uh, your novel course for writers workshop, and that's now in its sixth year. And every single time we've run the course, 24 times now, there have always been people writing fantasy, usually young adult fantasy. Um, apart from one particular course, this one that finished two weeks ago, seven out of eleven of the people on the course were writing fantasy. Although there was a lot of discussion about whether it really was fantasy or magical realism or speculative or dystopian or even science, etc. etc. So it's clear that it's you know a very, very popular genre and also a very competitive genre. And in order to succeed in writing in that genre, you have to be really, really good. And you also have to have something that is absolutely unique and no one else has. And so it's a delight to have these two authors here this evening because they clearly fulfil that criteria. Um, Natasha studied English at Oxford, worked at Waterstones as a bookseller, then at Cambridge University Press as a publishing assistant in the Astronomy and Maths department. She's got a creative writing um, MA from UEA, studied in Tokyo, where she lived on a scholarship from the Dewa Anglo-Japanese Foundation, and is now a visiting lecturer at City University. Her first novel, the watchmaker of Philip Street was an international bestseller, Guardian Summer Read, Amazon Best Book of the Month, Better Trask Award winner of 2016, and was shortlisted for the Authors Club Best First Novel Award and a finalist for the Locust First Novel Award, which is a really impressive list. And the Bed Bedlam Slacks is her Slacks, sorry, is her second novel. Samantha started writing at 15, got an early start. Uh, from 2010 to 13, studied English language and literature at St Anne's College in Oxford. 2012, the Woman of the Future Award shortlisted her for the Young Star Award. In 2013, she published The Bone Season, the first in a seven-book series set in 2059. In 2014, was included on the Evening Standards Power 1000 list. The Mime Order followed in 2015. Both are international bestsellers, translated into 26 languages. The film rights have been optioned by the Imaginarium Studios and 20th Century Fox. And The Song Rising is her third novel, published in uh, earlier this year. If you look at the front of the bones season, that's the list of accolades and awards that she's got. I've had to say this is kind of fantasy. I could just um, say that I find it hilarious that I was on the Power Thousand list for the Evening Standard. That's the thousand most powerful people in London. Like I was at the event and I was with like Stephen Hawking and people like that. And I was like, I had no idea I had this much power. <laughs> I would be like the Sith Lord of London. Like George Osborne was walking around, and I was like, I've got it's a scary man. So yeah, that's one of the things I can't fully understand. So just ignore that one. <laughs> Can we start off by both of you explain what your journey to publication was like? Can we start with you? Yes, um, I think mine was thoroughly run of the mill. Um, I wanted to write for a long time because I realised, aged about uh, 19, that it was the only thing I could do. I was rubbish at everything else. Um, and my, my friend said, you really need to do a creative writing MA. So I applied to the one that was nearest to my house. Um, and that was the University of East Anglia. They happened to be quite good. So that, that helped. Um, I met my agent through some very, very targeted networking events they do at the university, um, which is why anyone who's wanting to do this, a creative writing MA, is very worthwhile. Um, I met my agent through that. Um, and then there was this awful stage where we thought we wouldn't sell the book to anybody. It went out for auction. Nobody wanted it. We rewrote it, it went out for auction again, nobody wanted it except one very junior editor here, who is now a much more senior editor, which is nice. <laughs> but that's it. So did you write the novel on, as part of your MA? Is that the... Yes, it started life as three short stories and became a full-length novel on the MA. At that point I thought, yes, I'm finished, of course that's foolish and wrong. It was the first draft and then it was another three years in the writing after that. Now I'm really curious about what the short stories were. Was it like Grace and then, yep. like, with basically the three main characters? Separate? Yeah, the first one, has anyone read the book, Watchmaker? Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> you people, nice, nice. The first short story was Daniel meeting Maury and the bomb going off. Uh -huh. The second one was meeting Katsu, and yeah. the third one was meeting Grace. Ah, cool. They all went in. It was fine. Katsu's the best character. Yeah, he is. Clockwork which, octopus. Which is really annoying because they spent loads of time on the human characters. <laughs> yeah, I know, there's more on the octopus, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole book just about the octopus. So, your journey? Um, yeah, so I. Like, like you said, I started writing, technically I started writing my first novel when I was 15. I did write before that, but I'm not one of those people who's like, I was writing the moment I was born, because <laughs> I wasn't. Um, so I probably started writing when I was about sort of 10 or 11, and then kind of I got, in, I got into writing like fan fiction when I was 12. Um, I used to, Yeah, I used to, every time I saw a movie, I would write the sequel, and then I think it was the best sequel, like and all other sequels were terrible. Um, so yeah, I wrote fanfiction without really knowing even what it was, I didn't know that fanfiction was a thing. Um, then when I was 15 I started writing a novel called Aurora, which was what I now deem to be Twilight with aliens, and any <laughs> good things about Twilight were not in it, so it was like a, a crap Twilight with aliens. Um, it was like about this girl who was a young English woman who meets a very attractive alien and he falls immediately in love with her. Um, and. I tried to sell it to publishers and I went through like a year of what I personally thought was a hellish publishing experience. You know, I sent, I sent out the manuscript to everyone, not realising that many, many authors go through literally hundreds of rejections. I would get like five and just think I, I was like a broken woman by the end of it. Um, I mean, I was only like 15, 16, so you know, bear with me, I was a very emotional teenager. Um, so yeah, I went through the whole process, I got the Writers and Artists Yearbook, I sent it off to loads of agents, hand delivered the manuscript to some agents in London. Um, nobody wanted it. Um, apart, well, there was one one agent called David Godwin who he was very kind about it, and he said that he would like he thought I had like some natural talent, and he would like to see more work from me. Um, and I very cheekily asked him if I could do work experience for him because even if if I couldn't be an author, I wanted to work in publishing in some capacity. And he said, yeah, sure, you can come and do an internship at the summer. So in the summer of 2011, which was um, just after my first year of university, I went to do two weeks of work experience for David, um, during which I learned a lot of very valuable things and um, I learned about why exactly agents reject manuscripts, because you can, I think as a young, well, an author of any age, you can get quite angry with agents and you feel like they just don't get you, like you're a genius and they just don't get you, and then when you see it from the other side you realise how many manuscripts they get and they need to be able to sell it and feel passionate about it. So I did that. Um, while I was working for David, he, his office is quite near here in the district of Seven Dials, um, and I became very inspired by Seven Dials. It's basically seven streets coming together on a junction. There's lots of new agey shops that sell like crystal balls and tarot cards, stuff like that. I suddenly got this idea for writing a novel about clairvoyance in the future. Um, and I kind of rolled that together with an idea I'd had about horrible supernatural creatures controlling Oxford, and it became the bone season. So I went away and wrote it. So I know I'm going on a bit. It's a long. This is a long process. Um, then I went. I wrote, went and wrote it at Oxford. Um, wasn't going to send it out because I was too scared of being rejected. Uh, but Ali Smith, the very well-known Scottish author, came to be a lecturer at uh, Saint Anne's College and she was offering to look at students' writing and give feedback on it. So I sent her the first chapter of The Bone Season. I was completely terrified that she was going to tell me it was terrible, because um, I think she had a bit of a reputation for being very honest in her approach to <laughs> students' writing, and I was like, oh god, she's going to break me, I'm going to just be left with just a broken woman again. Um, and she just sat me down and said, I think, I think you're a natural, I think you should send this to an agent straight away. So sent it to David, didn't expect him to take it because he doesn't really represent fantasy, but he said he wanted it, sold it to Bloomsbury, end of long story. <laughs> just as a side note to that, I was at Oxford at the same time, but I'm slightly older, so I was in... I think, Were you at the same time? I was, I, think I was in third year when you were in first year. Yeah. And I remember reading with spitting hatred oh. <laughs> in the Oxford newspaper that there was some pissy little undergraduate who <laughs> 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 got a seven book deal with Bloomsbury. And you were the object of the hatred of the entirety of the writing population of New College. Yes, you were. Your name was in the mud. <laughs> I did not know 
hear this. I mean, I saw, I saw, some, I saw some like hate comments on like the Daily Mail. Where oh, that wasn't us. <laughs> well, we kept our hatred quiet, but it was there. It was, it was this person just coming out of nowhere, getting a book deal. Yeah, that was exactly us. Okay, but we didn't write that. No, I remember you probably would have read about it in the Oxford Student, right? Yes. Yeah, I did, yeah, I did yeah, another yeah. interview with them. In the ISIS. My dear. Yeah. In the ISIS. I worked for the Oxford Student, so I feel very like that is the Oxford newspaper. Okay. Me. Not the Churwell, yeah. not the ISIS. Just, just a the Oxford Student. deal is pretty spectacular. It was actually really annoying. annoying. It, was, it, it was actually a three book deal initially, um, and then they were going to buy the other. It was like a, they called it a projected seven book deal. So oh, it was three okay. books, and then if the first book does well, we'll buy the rest. And I was lucky that the bone season did do well and they bought the rest. But I'm really, it, it's very interesting to know that I was yeah. the object of such hatred. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Really? Not hatred? Really? Oh no, just that right hatred. Yeah, we were <laughs> They were going to poison like, my cup of wine. Like uh, coronary wine. penetrating <laughs> hatred. <laughs> <laughs> Long time. <laughs> I probably would have felt the same if I'd seen someone yeah, get a book yeah, deal. Exactly. <laughs> In fact, I did feel like that when I saw people get book deals before I got one because I was yeah. so desperately jealous. So, it's yeah. only natural. <laughs> yeah, it's like when you see somebody else having your dream, it's like, it's like you know, it's a big thing. Yeah, but I have to say, I, I find it... <laughs> I found, you know, when, when somebody that I've been working with succeeds, I'm so happy for them. I'm oh, so happy You're a nicer them. human than you're I really, am. <laughs> you're, you're, very, you're very American in your approach style. And whenever I went on American articles, they'd be like, oh, fantastic. A young woman's got a book deal. Because I've helping them to get their books published. That's so very that nice. So that, for me, is, is, is the main aim. And um, I have to say, most of them don't have MAs. And you know, Oxford degrees and so on. So you know, you you two are quite sort of special in that respect, and you're not necessarily representative of, of the wider. Mm. Um, so I was checking your Twitter oh, no. blogs, and I noticed <laughs> you describe your novels as history, his, yeah. historical fiction, uh, with a twist. Um, so there's a lot of talk about genre straddling, and it seems like you've straddled just about every genre that there is. Do my best. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> gymnastic at times. It must be, it must be. But for you, the, the historical aspect is the defining... I think, well, the defining aspect, I think, is the fantasy, but I call it historical fiction because it nine-tenths is. So it's very bound by what actually happened. It's very bound by real accounts real science, um, real expeditions, so, and, and the fantasy element is small, and I think often it's smaller than I make it look, mm -hmm. because I, and the reason for that is that I think it's really important to blur the edges between real and fantasy, I think fantasy feels more fantastical and more magical often if you don't know exactly where the boundary is, mm. I'm also aware that it can be hugely annoying. So I really hope that it isn't hugely annoying for the people who are reading it, but it's, um, it is on purpose. Mm, mm, that's interesting. And of course your novels are set in the future. Yes, so but everyone wears Victorian clothes, which is very confusing. It's alternative future. Right? You describe yeah, yourself as like, um, one aeronaut? An aeronaut. On, on aeronaut. It's basically a really just pretentious way of it means like dream traveller. But you've got to make yourself stick out it's in your Twitter bio, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> you've got to say something interesting in your Twitter bio. Like, otherwise it'd just be like, author of the phone season. <laughs> That's basically what mine is. That is my so, defining yeah, quality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have all these interesting things, like you travelled to Japan and so you studied in Japan, just like, yep, yeah, I just... That is it. I am the author of the bone season. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a, a. It basically it's like astronaut, but dreams. So I guess I consider myself a that as a writer. Dream sailor. Yeah, it's, it's like a dream sailor. So cool. Sailor. Yeah, it's, that's kind of, <laughs> I guess that's kind of what you are as a writer. You're like a, a dream astronaut. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So you're writing historical fiction. You're writing in the future. 2059. Mm -hmm. 2059. Yeah. 2059. But the one thing that all fantasy has in common is the need for world building, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. although your world is much more recognisable and rooted in reality, yours is more your version of where we'll be going. Well, it's sort um, of. It's like, I don't actually think that there's going to be like an outbreak of clairvoyance <laughs> and stuff like that. But yeah, it is futuristic. <laughs> but both of you have to do world building. Both of yeah. you have... Um, fictional worlds that you know and that your reader doesn't. So I want to talk a bit about your approach to how you do that world building within the story without overloading the reader with info dumps about how things work and so on. It's, so I do it, I think, in the laziest possible way. And it's, I always start with character and dialogue because that's always what I'm interested in. I kind of don't care what the carpet looks like or even how the world works. If there's magic, I really don't care at the start. 
Um, but if, as soon as it affects a person, that's much more interesting for me. Um, and so that naturally steers you away from any kind of encyclopedic Wikipedia-like information dump, because there will never, I'm never just interested in a particular thing and write a paragraph about it and put it in. It has to be a particular thing that's related to a human being. But that's, I think that's fairly similar to most people's processes, to be yes. honest. I don't think that's anything extraordinary. Um, but I think one of the things that I've noticed about first drafts is they always start life looking like a, a play script because it is just dialogue. And then prose stuff comes in later and later and later. And obviously, like, the, the actual details, the real world building, I think as I would recognise it from a critical point of view, is the last thing that goes in. It's just the embellishment over the top of the framework. Yeah. So late is the answer. Late and lazy. <laughs> and I think, it's, I think it's really interesting because, you know, you, you, as you say, plot and character are the things that carry a story. And then the world building just happens to be the setting for that story, doesn't it? Yeah. So, you know, and I think to put it in where it's necessary, where it affects a character, that's, that's where it goes. But I would never start with a passage of world building. Mm -hmm. I think that's far too difficult. You have to have such a good idea of what the world is already. I don't have a good enough imagination for that. It has to start out with someone saying, good morning, what would you like for breakfast? <laughs> I wonder if that's sort of more the case for you because it is the real world, whereas, yeah. you know, it might be slightly different for you. Yeah, um, I, I did have to do a bit of, I don't want to say info dumping in the first chapter of the boat season, but there is some information given to the reader. Okay, <laughs> there's info dumping. Um, and it's... It was, it was a hard decision to make because it's, uh, I, I build very big, complex worlds that rely on very complicated magic systems. So to some extent, I have to take the reader aside a little bit and tell them what's going on, which I think is fine as long as it's done you know, in a, in a subtle-ish way. Um, but yeah, I, it's, in terms of world building, I definitely need a character as well. And what I tend to do is I tend to have enough of the world for it to hold together in my mind. So I have the basic rules, I know, you know the, the setting and sort of the... just You know, I have the basics of it. But I have to put the character in there before it can really get going. I have to... The, the character becomes the engine of the world for me. So I imagine, you know, when I'm in the Bone Season world, I imagine my main character, Paige, walking down a street, for example, and I'm thinking, what is she hearing and seeing and smelling? And why is that happening? But, you know, is she seeing a billboard with something on it? What, what does it say? And it, I, I have to be in her head to start putting the meat on the bones. So, yeah, I just do a skeletal plan, and then the character adds the flesh for me, generally speaking. Pretty much what I expected you both to say. Yeah, we're both predictable creatures. Well, no, sure as well. It's the way we yeah. work best. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, in terms of research, what's so, um, your Obviously, again, yours is going to be probably greater. You know it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, went to much. Peru. I did go to Peru. With a grant from the Society of Authors. I did. Um, of yes. I was forced to go by my publicist here. I, I decided that it was a perfectly okay thing to have written an entire draft about a story set completely in Peru, not having been there, which is, of course, a stupid idea. And my publicist rightly said, so, have you been to Peru? I was like, no, why would I go to Peru? It's horrible there. And then she goes, do you speak Spanish? I like, no. <coughs> starting to get nervous at this point. She goes, on your bike. <laughs> and I said, can I have some money? She went, no. <laughs> so I had to apply for a travel grant from the Society of Authors. Um, they're great with stuff like this. Um, so they gave me some money and off I went. Two, uh, three months in Peru, two and a half months of that was living in Lima, close to a language school where I went every day, learned Spanish, um, which is a lovely language. You speak Spanish, don't you? And you speak Japanese, which yeah. is, and we, we, so we're both writing books where we require the other person's language. <laughs> <laughs> I, I speak it much more rustily than I used to, but yeah, I used to be nearly fluent in it, yeah. Yeah, I can't, I can't produce it so well anymore, but I mm. do try and watch films and stuff. Mm. But it's a lovely language because it's so close to English. Yeah. And just, after yeah. Japanese, it felt like I got to this, I, I got to a point about two months in, sort of just before I left the school, where I got quite angry with Spanish because I was like, it's a joke language. You can just guess things. What the earth is this? It's not a proper language. And it was, it was just, it was, and the reason for that was that. I studied Japanese for a year, solidly, at a very, very strict language school in Tokyo with teachers who were slave drivers. They hated us. And it was, um, 
it was punishing, we took exams, it was, the amount of study was incredible, it was like nine hours every day, pushing kanji into your brain, and it was awful, and I loved it. After a year of Japanese, and after a month living with a Japanese family who didn't speak English, only speaking Japanese for an entire month, way up in the north of Japan where there were no other foreigners for about 100 miles around, I had reached the level of Japanese that I reached in Spanish after a month and a half. It was fantastically annoying. Because it was just, it wasn't that I hated Spanish, it was that it was, it was so irritating that I'd not pushed further in Japanese. So I was at, after two months, I was much more fluent in Spanish than I was in Japanese. So that was nice in one way, and really annoying in another way. But the reason I did that was so that I could go traveling through Peru and speak to the people who I needed to speak to. And they weren't the relatively wealthy, very, very Spanish-speaking people who live in Lima. They were the less wealthy indigenous people who live sort of more toward inland Peru and the Inca heartlands around sort of Cusco and Machu Picchu. And their first language is Quechua, which is very, very difficult to learn because there's only one language school and it's way up uh, in the mountains in Peru. And I got horrible altitude sickness and I wouldn't have been able to learn anything. I was flat on the floor on oxygen. No way would it have happened. So it was much better to, to learn Spanish in Lima and speak in Spanish rather than try to learn Quechua, although in an ideal world that's what would have happened. So I, yeah, so I had Spanish and I was running around after Quechua speakers uh, going, please, please tell me about the nature of time and the Quechua language. <laughs> People were very obliging about this, it was, it was great. Um, and it was, it was this huge fact-checking mission because, fact-checking mission, because I'd cheerfully announced in the first few chapters of the Bedlam Stacks that I'm going to wait to learn Spanish in three months, and I was like, actually, probably should check that that's possible. Probably need to do it in order to convince anyone that it is possible. <laughs> so I did that. I was checking things like cultural attitudes toward time, cultural attitudes toward stone, just lots of kind of pootling around and getting on buses and, and talking to people, which it's, it was really nebulous research, and I didn't really know what I was looking for, but I think it was, it was really kind of authenticity. It was, can I convincingly write this? to look like real Peru rather than just a kind of vague rubbish Peru that I've envisaged in the back of my head conjured from just like scraps of Wikipedia articles. So the book changed a lot having done that. So you'd already done a draft when you went to... Yeah, it was, it was done. It was chronologically done by the time I went, but a lot changed once I once I learned Spanish and been travelling. So it was, yeah, it was so a very productive trip. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> that was a long story. Do you do research for your books? Um, for the Bible season, it doesn't require quite so much research. Um, I'm, I'm writing another book at the moment, though, called The Priory of the Orange Tree, and for that I went to Japan. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to get a grant from the Society of Authors, otherwise I would have liked to spend a lot longer there than I did, but I was obviously limited because Japan is extremely expensive. Um, so I went on a, a tour. Uh, which was which was really nice. Um, but yeah, for the bone season, it's I pretty much just take liberties because I'm not really writing about anything that requires a huge amount of research because it's set in the future. I do do some research on the Victorian era, um, and the fourth book is actually going to be set in Paris, so I need to go and have make a few visits to Paris just just to kind of pick up oh, the atmosphere. No, it's the so hardship. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so sad. <laughs> but then again, it is, it, yeah, I, I wish I could get money from the Society of Authors because that'd be very helpful. But just why? I have to buy. Oh no, they said no. no. Oh, <laughs> it probably doesn't help that there are like articles out there that claim that I'm a millionaire, which uh, I'm not. It was a complete lie. <laughs> but right. they do exist. So I think they knew I was pretty impoverished at that point. <laughs> yeah, I think some people genuinely think I'm a millionaire because <laughs> there was one erroneous report that claimed I had a multi-million pound deal which I wish I had a lot of really good deal. Um, yes, yeah, so that's probably why. Um, but yes, yeah, so I would, I would have liked to do more research. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think, I don't think you have to go to a place because I think that if we, if we made that claim, then it would restrict it to authors who have the means to do that. And I think that, you know, to, it's, you can write about a place without having visited it. But I think if you can visit it, it's very helpful because you can pick up on a lot of things you wouldn't have known. You can actually speak to people from the country. It was immensely helpful going to Japan even for a week. And I came home and immediately wanted to add things and change things in the already 300,000 word novel that is The Priory of the Orange Tree. So I couldn't add that much to it. Um, but yeah, it was very, very helpful. And, um, Did you just say 300,000 words? 
Yes, ma'am. Long, long book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a really long book. Um, yeah, so, and I've also done a, the, the British Library has been an amazing resource. Like, I was, when I started researching Priory, it's a very, it's kind of about, again, it's fantasy, but it's very heavily based in the, in the Elizabethan era and sort of Japanese uh, 17th, 16th century history. And I didn't know anything about Japan when I went into it. So I basically, I started trying to order all these academic books online and they were all like £100. So I was like, okay, this, I'm going to have to find a solution to this. And someone was like, why don't you try the British Library? And it was amazing. I spent just hours ensconced in there just learning about Japanese history and Elizabethan fashion. It's just been amazing. It'd be interesting to know how much of all of that makes its way into the final version of the novel because I think a lot of the time, you know, we, we, we soak all of that stuff up and it's the things that I think that, you know, as the authors we need to have. But actually the reader needs less than you actually think. But it pervades the whole story, doesn't and it? And really it stops change. you from making a horrible error. Yes. More than anything. Because yeah. particularly if you're writing fiction, you don't have to be guided by anyone's real life, you don't have to be guided by real events necessarily, even if you're writing historical fiction, you could be writing something that falls into the gaps of history that's unrecorded, so you're making it up completely. But it, the danger of that is that you write something wildly unrealistic for the period or the place or whatever, mm -hmm. and a vast amount of research will stop you doing that. You'll get in the ballpark of creditable if you've done the research, whereas if you haven't, you're very likely to make a really bad error. So it's invisible, really? Yeah, it is. It's enough to make the reader feel that it's authentic and buy into it as reality. I think so. It establishes parameters of realism, I think. Yeah, and it's also great as well as making a hideous error, there's finer details as well. Like, um, for example, like in the era of Japan that I was going into, the Japanese largely had two syllable names rather than three syllable names, and I just wouldn't have known that from research. Syllable names? Yeah, like the number of syllables oh, yeah. in the names. It tend, nowadays, it's often you have a three syllable name in Japanese, that's more common, but in the Edo period, it was more like a two syllable name. It's just, it's just details like that that you just wouldn't Those know are otherwise. Details, they are very important because details, yeah. While it might slip completely over the head of the majority of readers, you actually don't want to get it wrong for those readers who will know. There'll be yes. one scholar who writes oh, there'll be, you. There'll be really scholars. <laughs> yeah, like, and especially if it's if it's a person who is from that country and knows what they're talking about. You don't want to act as if you're only writing for people who don't know the history. You know, you want to be as authentic as possible because you're you're essentially kind of going into a culture that isn't yours. So you have to be as respectful to it as possible and do as much research as you physically can. So can we talk a bit about writing series? Sure. Um, <laughs> did you know at the beginning you were writing a whole series and it was going to be seven books? Yeah, um, I did. Um, I think actually I remember coming into Bloomsbury and they sort of, without me telling them it was a seven book series, they were like, it's a seven book series, isn't it? Because the number seven is mentioned so much in these books. So like, <laughs> the, you know, the, the main gang is called the Seven Seals, there's seven orders of clairvoyance, they all live in a place called Seven, seven Dials, books. there are seven Raphite families, there's a lot of seven going on. So they immediately were like, yeah, so seven books, right? And you're like, no. And I was like, I was like, well, I knew, I I knew they probably didn't want to give a debut unknown author a seven book deal so I was like I mean ideally that'd be great <laughs> um so they gave me a three book deal initially and then very lucky the bone season did well so they signed me up for seven um but yeah I knew it was going to be a long series because I'm trying to do something with the bone season which is essentially write epic dystopia like I want it to be like epic fantasy scale but a dystopia um so I wanted it to go to multiple cities multiple countries I basically wanted to explore how a revolution grows into total war between countries and to do that I would need a large number of books because you know I've always even though I love a lot of dystopia out there for me the the Hunger Games for example I love but I just it all happened too quickly for me you know the revolution just sort of happens and they overthrow the dictator and he's gone great he's gone that never happens in real life like revolutions take tend to take a long time something like the Russian Revolution it generally takes a, a fair few years for a revolution to happen if not decades so I wanted to explore that and I was very lucky that Bloomsbury had given me the chance to, to do that by giving me that number of books. So did you know the narrative arc for the whole series? Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I have a, again, I have the skeleton of the whole thing and sometimes it can change enormously. Um, for example, my latest book, The Song Rising, if you if you read my blog or follow me on any kind of social media, you'll know that I had a bit of a, a hellish time writing it because I, I wrote a draft which was not brilliant. Um, I was kind of rushing it because when, when you write a series and you have 
read it, you suddenly feel the pressure of having to get the book out roughly every year because people don't like being kept waiting. And the Mime Order came out a year and a half after the bone season. And in my panic to get the book out and in a year, I sort of rushed off this draft and got it to my editor and it wasn't as strong as it should have been. So it actually ended up changing a lot from the book I originally planned it to be. It's much, much better now. Um, but yeah, so I tend to have the, the destination in mind, but the way I get there can change. But yeah, I know what's going to happen in all of the remaining books, pretty much. Not saying the fine details aren't going to change, but I think it's good to know where you're going. And I, I do broadly know the whole narrative because I had to know that to know how many books it was going to take up. So would somebody be able to come in at book three and then be fascinated no. enough to go back to book one? No, no, no. They someone have to be read to someone said to me once, oh, I've just read the Mime Order, fantastic. And I was like, oh, great, did you like the Bone Season? They were like, the what? <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, how the hell did you understand what was happening? Like, it was like, it was totally bizarre to me that they'd read the, the Mime Order and they must have had all these mentions of what had gone on in the last book. And it was just, I mean, great, they enjoyed it. Maybe you can enjoy it, but I definitely wouldn't recommend going in later because, you know, big twists happen. And if you go in at book three, you're going to ruin the book in, you know, the twist at the end of book two and so on. It's, it's not one of those series that you, I don't think, that you can just kind of come to and pick it up. It's, I think it's, that's pretty a high risk strategy of reading the post season. Uh, I mean, that's quite a high risk strategy for your publisher as well. Yes, yes. Of course, then the, the, the commitment is that much greater because normally with a series, they hope to get new readers in with each new book who are then fascinated enough to go back and read the the um, previous ones but yeah I mean I think generally series do work like that now I mean I, there are some I, I can only think of a few I mean I guess it, it's mostly more children's books I think where the series are kind of you can pick them up individually I don't really hear of many like young adult slash adult series where they're all separate and um, there's one that Bloomsbury does called Take Back the Skies by Lucy Saxon which is a YA and that one you can just pick up any of them but it's quite I do find that YA and adult tends to be more it just rolls on rather than it being kind of separate like you think that's because they're they tend to be more plot based so you won't have a series of characters facing a series of different um, you know, sets of jeopardy or whatever. Yeah, it's weird kind of how, how series work in terms of structure. So, But then you kind of get middle books like Harry Potter as well, because even though Harry Potter broadly has a plot that continues, it is basically the same pattern for the first sort of five books. You know, Harry's at home with the Dursleys, he goes to Hogwarts, Voldemort appears, he defeats Voldemort and he goes home. Like that is basically the pattern of the first five Potter books. And that is still, you know, you still probably couldn't read like the, the Prisoner of Azkaban and know exactly what's going on. But there's, I think the reason Harry Potter had that kind of appeal is because there was a comfort in knowing what we were going to get every time. We, d we didn't know the exact details of it, but we knew the rough pattern we were getting. So we knew what we were getting when we picked up a Harry Potter book. Um, with with my series, I'm actually trying to do the direct opposite to that. So you literally have no idea what is going to happen in any book. And that means you can't guess the ending. Every book is supposed to actually be a completely different genre from the last book. So the Bone Season is kind of like a jailbreak. My Order is a murder mystery. The Song Rising is a heist novel. The fourth one is more political. Every single one is supposed to be a separate genre. And I'm hoping that means that readers cannot guess the ending of each one because they have no <coughs> idea what they're going to get when they open it, except that they're going to follow the same cast of characters. I said at the beginning, uh, in order to succeed, you have to be unique in some kind of a way. And I think you, know, you just nailed what was, what's unique about what you're writing. It's amazing. I hope so. I'm, sure, I'm sure other writers do as well. But I, that's, I, I just wanted to kind of approach it like that, just in order to keep it unpredictable, I guess. <laughs> that genre straddling thing is something that you do both have in common, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. one of you, in one of the reviews, it mentioned Fifty Shades. as having a sort of... I thought that might be you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think yours is even remote. <laughs> like 50, I don't think mine is even remotely like Fifty Shades. I mean, I don't, he hadn't read it, that guy, I don't think. Um, but yeah, that was a puzzling comparison, seeing as there is not, not so much as a stitch of sex in, in the first any of these books so far, so how they conjured up Fifty Shades is slightly beyond me. <laughs> I was like, how did I accidentally write a Fifty Shades comparison book? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, weird. <laughs> so um, in terms of timings, I think people don't realise how glacial the pace of publishing is, mm -hmm. so um, writers will often be thinking, like, well, what, you know, what's on, what's in now, you know, and I'll write that now, not mm -hmm. realising that, A, it would probably take years to actually write it, and then it may take years to get an agent, and then more years to get 
publishing deal, and then once they get that deal, it's going to be another year or two years before the book actually hits the shelves. Yeah, no, you can't write to trends. It's not it's not a good strategy to adopt, generally speaking. It's really not a good idea, is it? Yeah. yeah. Unless you can whip out a book in like a week, yeah. that's it's brilliant, yeah, and an agent yeah. picks it up immediately. Um, but yeah, not 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 generally a good strategy to. But I remember hearing one agent saying, oh, vampires, vampires are gone now, it's angels now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that, that was a while ago, so that's probably changed as well. What sort of trends do you see around at the moment? Um, hmm, I don't, I don't actually know. Like, I think we've, we've definitely done all the sort of the vampire, angel, porn... <laughs> 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 you just can't resist, can you? <laughs>